I'm going to start with the foundations of science and biology. I want to start with an introduction to science. You know, there are a lot of misconceptions of, out there about science. But I'm going to take a quote from one of my favorite scientists of all time, Dr. Carl Sagan. He was an astronomer at Cornell University. And more than just being a scientist, he was also a very strong science advocate. And he said, science is much more than a body of knowledge. It is a way of thinking. This is central to its success. Science invites us to let the facts in, even when they don't conform to our preconceptions. Here are the learning outcomes for this chapter. I'm not going to read all of these, but you should go over them. And as you go over them and you start to learn the material, make sure that you can actually answer all of these questions. Let's start with a simple question. What is science? For most people, you probably think it's a collection of facts that have been memorized. Or C, something you're forced to learn in school. Yep, most of you probably guessed B, a process to gain understanding of the natural world. Always remember this, science is more than a collection of facts that have been memorized. But, that being said, we still have to memorize some words and some facts so that we can start to understand science. Science. It offers a pathway to understanding the natural world. Science is a process. It's a way of thinking. Now here's something else I want you to start thinking about. What is this natural world? What do we mean by that? Now here's a good question for you. A little bit harder. Is science limited? No? Yes? Maybe? Yep. A lot of people chose A, no, but in actuality, science is limited to explanations and observations that meet certain criteria. Now you should be asking yourself, what is that certain criteria that puts a limit on science? Let's talk about that, the nature and limitations of science, and I'm also going to talk a little bit about how science has changed over time. The word science it actually means the desire to know. And as I've said earlier, science is a process. It's a process of gaining knowledge about the world. And the way we do science has changed over time, and so has our knowledge. One of the biggest things that has come out of the last 400 years of people doing science is that we now use experiments to either support or refute our hypothesis. And you'll notice I didn't say prove our hypothesis. I'm going to come back to that more later, though scientists don't actually set out to prove anything. They try to refute stuff. And a hypothesis that we, that we don't refute, we actually say are well supported. Here's a great example of how our knowledge has changed and how the process of doing science has changed. Now, Galileo, he's a very smart guy, and he challenged long-held beliefs about gravity by conducting a single experiment. You see, about over 2,000 years ago, Aristotle said, hey, two objects of different mass will fall at different rates. And as you can guess, he thought that the heavier object would fall faster than the lighter object. Now that was taken to be as fact for almost 1,800 years. People just knew that that had to be right. We call that anecdotal evidence, common sense knowledge, but what Galileo did was an experiment. He went up to the Leaning Tower of Pisa, according to legend, and dropped two spheres. One was heavy, one was light. And to everybody's amazement, guess what? They fell at the same rate. That's science. With one experiment over 1,800 years of common sense knowledge was overturned in a moment. All it took was an experiment for people to realize that objects of the same mass will fall at the same rate, and not unless there's a lot of wind turbulence or something. So let's get back to the nature and limitations of science. Here's our little ghost crab right here. You know, you can go to a beach, you can observe these ghost crabs, you can measure it, you can test them. So science is limited. It's limited to studying the natural world. Now your next question should be, well, what exactly is the natural world? The natural world includes phenomena that are potentially observable, measurable, and testable. Now I use the word potentially 
because some things may be difficult to observe. Unlike this ghost crab here, you can walk down the beach and find it. Now some ideas, myths, and legends, they're outside the realm of science. So the idea that the world is on the back of some elephants riding on a giant turtle swimming through the cosmos, you see, that's outside of the realm of science. And the reason why is, well, it's not the natural world. There's no way to potentially observe it, measure it, or even test for a giant turtle and these elephants holding up the world. So we would say that's outside the realm of science. We don't even entertain those kinds of ideas. But let's get back. Potentially measurable and observable. Here we go. Here's a little verdant. This bird, we're taking his weight right here. Small desert dwelling bird. Well, we're observing him and we're measuring him. So asking questions about this bird would definitely be within the realm of science. Now, sometimes you can't always see things like radio waves. They're everywhere. They are running your phone. They're running our radios, our televisions, and there are radio waves coming from the deep space. Now, you can't directly see a radio wave because our eyes just, we don't have the ability to detect those photons. But these large satellite dishes from the VLA, which is a very large array in New Mexico, they can detect very, very, very faint radio waves. So even though we can't directly see something, we use the word potentially measurable and observable because in this case, to detect radio waves from deep space, it took an advancement in technology and a rather large budget to build the VLA. Other things that we use for measuring and observing are MRIs that you might use in a hospital. Now, the last thing is, there are many fields of science. It's a really broad endeavor. There's chemistry, physics, geology, astronomy. But biology is unique. Biology is the study of life. And to really fully appreciate biology and understand it, we need to know chemistry and physics and geology and climate science. And we actually have to know a little bit of astronomy too. And we're going to learn some astronomy in the next chapter. And I'm going to show you how science is actually connected to astronomy and geological processes. So in some ways, I like to call biology the apex science.